So, what does uh, social entrepreneurship have to do with uh, technology or innovation? Everything. Not so much necessarily about technology. Technology is more like a tool. Perhaps it should be a tool. But it has everything to do with innovation. But first and foremost, it has everything to do with action. You know, once you're done with the brainstorming and the processes and uh, the meetings and the crowdfunding and, you know, it's in the action. It's only in the action, the implementation of a solution that you make an impact. All the other processes are taking place in, uh, in an area uh, on a planet where people are not necessarily being affected positively. Social entrepreneurship is about the action. And what is it? Well, there are many definitions, but we define social entrepreneurship in the following way. It's introducing a new solution to a social problem, i.e. there is innovation. And that's the social part. The other two parts are actually very standard for any entrepreneur or any venture capitalist or any business. It's really to scale the solution, spread it, using business methods, business development. And then you would like to create a sustainable organization that creates value, that actually spreads the solution and um, can help more people faster. So it's, uh, it's innovation, it's social. Uh, you've got to make the things sustainable, otherwise you can't be a credible supplier. And of course, there is a debate now as well uh, about measurement. How much should you measure? But everybody's looking for impact. Everybody's looking for impact, as are we. Uh, and who are we? Um, just got to flip through a few things about, uh, about us. Um, by the way, for those of you who, are, uh, who follow me on, on Twitter, you, you would know that the hashtag for social entrepreneurship is uh, hashtag SUSENT or SUSENT. Um, that's also actually uh, that's in, with a C in English. Okay, this is our company. Uh, these are my resources. Um, and the unique thing about this slide is actually only one thing, which is truly unique about it. Um, and that is the business area in the right hand corner. We have taken the view um, that our vision and our mission and our values actually not only allows us, but it actually even perhaps uh, what's the word I could use? Um, it really empowers us to take on social entrepreneurship, to use social entrepreneurship as a way to make an impact beyond the financial impact, beyond the financial results that we do in the other business areas. So we've actually said, okay, uh, instead of Johan taking money out of the company uh, and go play, uh, not with himself, but for himself, uh, which is often is something that many people do. You know, they, they're successful, they take money out, they put it in the foundation, it's uh, very tax effective and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, you heard about Bill and Belinda, Belinda Gates and stuff. Um, and this is the reason, um, you know, that's the reason why some people are doing it that way. We have found out that what the social entrepreneurs need is exactly, exactly what we can supply. It's business development, it's recruitment, it's strategy, it's governance. No, your mom cannot sit on the board. Sorry. Um, it's selecting away things. It's concentrating on those services, those products that makes the most impact. So it's basically what we do for all our other companies. That's what we do for the social entrepreneurs. Um, here are some of our uh, brands. They don't really mean much. Um, 
in this context, uh, except for the fact that most of these companies are actually engaged with the social entrepreneurs. They sit on the boards. Um, some of you might be interested in engineering. Uh, Abel is actually on the board of both uh, a street newspaper, a Gata Visa Asphalt in Rogaland, and Pöbel Projekte. So using the people is really the key, key issue. Uh, these are the social entrepreneurs. We're focusing on kids and youth. For instance, uh, here's one of our, uh, well, they're, they're, you know the guy in uh, Big Bang, Sheldon? Yeah, of course, you all watch, watch that stuff, you know, because, uh, you know, he's a, he's a kid with, or he's a guy with Asperger's syndrome. Now, the cool thing about Asperger's syndrome is that they have a fantastic ability to concentrate to focus. They like repetition. You know, they like things to be in order. They like things to look nice and be symmetrical. And still, they drop out of school. Why? Because they have some issues with social skills, to put it that way. Uh, they have difficulty being around other people, like you and me, who uh, use irony in uh, the most peculiar places. But you can take them from sitting at home, living at home with mom and dad at the age of 32, through a program, three months, and they will be full-flown IT consultants. If you create a setting for them. And today, this little uh, consultancy uh, has customers like uh, Statoil, Hofslund, Dalton Skartweik, Veritas, Nordea, and so on. So this, is, this just proves that you can very easily, by focusing on the potential of the people, of each uh, guy, you can easily transport him out of the welfare system and into a full working environment. And out of the 17 boys who are in this company, Seven have moved out from their parents' apartment or house, and one even went on his first date recently. <laughs> yeah, that's actually that that's the, that's the that thing is the people uh, thing that people find the most uh, enticing, uh, and that's you know you can actually you can look at this in commercial or in monetary terms. What's the value of moving somebody from that position to this position? Or you can look upon it in human terms, you know, somebody being on the first date. And what is the value of, for instance, uh, let's pick one, a Pöbel Projekte, which actually picks up kids who are on the verge of uh, dropping out or getting into crime or even on their way to prison, trying out drugs. Um, basically, they don't trust anyone and they don't really don't give a shit. Um, Nobody really notices them, or they, they feel like they're not getting noticed. Um, and basically, they're on their way to becoming a liability. They're on the cost side of the Excel sheet very quickly. And then many of them will stay there for the rest of their lives. And many of them will get kids who will also stay there for the rest of their lives. So what's the value of bringing somebody like that back to a school track, work track, assuming they work for 35 years. The net present value is 11 million crowns. So imagine if you could use 100,000 crowns, or well, let's make it 110,000 so we get a even 100 times payback. Uh, you get a tremendous return on investment in areas like this. Sometimes it costs more, and sometimes it costs less. But still, the net present value is, that's about uh, a million quid to you, uh, more or less. And that's, you know, that's still money. Uh, that's a lot of money when you have a lot of people. And when you have a welfare state that's actually designed to take care of a kind of average, a kind of average that doesn't really exist through reforms, there were huge and all encompassing 
And we're, when it comes down to it, people are extremely different. And some of the most difficult cases, be it um, uh, Lixet, who tries to deal with young people who've had, uh, who have, were diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia, um, that don't go out of bed, uh, that never leave the house, um, they, don't have, they have no faith in themselves whatsoever. These are the type of people who simply fall through the cracks. The reforms were not made for them, you know. Uh, they need personal attention. They need very individualized solutions. And those type of solutions, they're really niche solutions designed by social entrepreneurs. It's a very focused solution to get them back on track. And it's not easy. Uh, it's actually very difficult. And there's, you know, um, we've had our crashes and burns. Uh, as you say, we had one uh, social entrepreneur in Bergen um, who bet everything on winning a public contract. And you know, they build up a huge uh, system of people who are actually, who could follow young people 24 hours a day. They were accessible 24 hours a day. Partly built on the experience that young people don't try drugs or other funky things during NOV's opening hours. They usually try somewhere between 12 and 4 at night. And that's when they called. And of course, this system was extremely expensive to operate, uh, and they ended up losing the contract. And they were wiped out. They went bankrupt. Um, this was not necessarily our fault, but we should have seen it coming. Uh, now we understand the, the system more and will not, that, uh, not let that happen again. But it's really about people like this, when you go all out. These are the most difficult, you would call them social case. Uh, you would call them a client, you would call them whatever. Uh, I call them Monica and Kai. They are vendors of a street magazine called, this, um, is it here? Yes, street magazine called Asphalt. A street magazine was a fabulous innovation that uh, happened, or somebody, I don't know who did it, but it was put on the street uh, in New York, 1989, after, uh, you remember, well, you're probably even too young for that, but there was a huge crash in the financial market in the fall of, of uh, 1987. A lot of people lost their jobs following that, uh, but they were not without resources, but they were put on the street, uh, many of them. So you basically, you make a magazine. I hope you all bought one, you know, uh, if, if you haven't. If, if this is concept is completely novel to you, then, uh, well, shame on you. Um, you should actually buy one next time you see somebody selling it, uh, especially the, the authorized, the licensed one. They pocket half the proceeds, and it gives them dignity. It reunites them with society. You can actually talk to them, and they can actually talk to you. Um, and they're mostly people who are isolated because they, most of them have been on drugs since they could spell the word. You see here that uh, Monica, she's been selling the street paper for about uh, a year and a half. Her brother, and they, yes, they're brothers and sisters, Kai, He's a little bit more reserved, withdrawn. Um, he's only been doing it for about six months. Um, you see, they're, they're connecting with me on two different levels. And of course, this innovation was made in 1989. We helped introduce this newspaper uh, in 2000 and. 11, it's, it's been spreading all over the world, so it's not, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not rocket science, it's not something you would come up with here, you know? 
It's, uh, it's basically, you know, it's editing, you know, it's uh, publishing. But the problem with this picture is that two days after it was taken, Kai was dead. You would say it's a, what do you call it, a drug-related uh, death, incident, cause. And what's the lesson? Well, the lesson is that the most valuable asset you have as an innovator, as an entrepreneur, as an investor, as a teacher, as a student, the most valuable asset you have is time. There was nothing that prevented us from introducing this solution earlier. I don't know if it would have made a difference to Kai, perhaps it would. We will never know. But the point is that you were all here who are doing funky stuff, uh, innovating, uh, designing, uh, calculating. In the end, you have to make it so that it can make an impact on the ground in one way or another. And it's really that impact, be it social or otherwise, that really makes it worthwhile. So you have to go for the impact. And you have to, perhaps more often than not, you have to try and fail, and try and fail again, and not think that you can actually make a calculation that makes the perfect issue, the perfect solution. Because you simply don't have the time. And Kai and Monica, they certainly did not have the time. Because if you want to make a difference, and you want to make, change somebody's future, then the longer you wait, the less future you have to change. Thank you. <laughs>